Safety Practitioner Act 22 of 20, 2019 has brought significant changes to the property industry. This act came into effect on the 1st of February 2022. Tonight we unpack all of those things that have caused changes in the property sector. This is the Private Property Podcast. My name is Dubi. Thank you so much for joining us. My guest tonight is Claire Laurent, who is a senior associate and legal manager at SSLR Incorporated. Tonight we talk all of those changes and some of the uh, challenges that this Property Practitioner Act has brought to, this, to, 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 the, to the sector. Claire, good evening and thank you so much for joining us. Hi, Timmy. Thanks, thanks for having me. Thank you. You know, we're talking about um, the Property Practitioner Act. Uh, before we jump into that conversation, tell us about um, SSLR Incorporated and some of the things that um, you guys as an organization do. Right. So SSLR is a law firm. We specialize in property law, all aspects of property law with a focus on evictions and uh, rental. Um, I think our... Uh, goal, ultimate goal, is to transform the property industry. And we do that by, by changing the law, sometimes in a, a di direct way by actually, uh, you know, things like commenting on draft regulations, and sometimes in a less direct way through actually making changes in court, setting precedents, and I think in practice. Um, the hope and goal being that we can strengthen the property uh, industry um, mm. And um, I think address a much needed issue in this country, which would be um, the availability of low cost housing. Sure. So much for that. And I was talking to someone just uh, earlier on this week and they were talking, oh, well, last week rather, and they were talking about how um, the, those, those people who are in the property space are no longer called estate agents, but rather property practitioners. Please just talk us through um, how this term came about and why they are now called property practitioners. Yeah, so I think to me the, the bigger um, issue, or not the issue, um, the promulgation of the Act has actually expanded um, not only the definition, but also um, the players. There are so many players in the property industry. If we're limited to just an estate agent or a rental agent, we're forgetting about a lot of players who have um, actually a duty to, to uphold um, you know, the, the certain requirements in terms of the act. So that basically the definition of a property practitioner is any person who uh, manages or deals with immovable property on behalf of a third party um, in the ordinary course of business. So in so doing that, they receive compensation in the form of um, uh, commission. Mm. Uh, a lot of the times I get asked, yeah, but I manage, uh, you know, we've got a family trust and we manage I manage the property on behalf of my family. Um, and they, the, the property, they can't be described there as a property practitioner because they're not managing the property on behalf of someone else hmm. or dealing with the property, should I say. Sure. So the 1st of February 2022 comes and the, the Property Practitioner Act gets, gets in force. What is the Property Practitioner Act and how does it change the landscape of the property space? Yeah, so I think it, it was a big scramble in in February, which we which, which we have witnessed mm. um, with the promulgation of the Act. the The biggest thing I would say is to to include all of those role uh, players that I've said, you know, every property practitioner. So that includes um, managing agents in terms of sectional title schemes, auctioneers, uh, bridging financing companies, etc. Um, the one of the more um, notable changes in or things that the Property Practitioners Act has brought about is the um, the mandatory disclosure form, which has been introduced. And I'll touch on that a, a bit later. But um, I think uh, if if a practitioner doesn't yet know what a mandatory disclosure form, I suggest that they that they 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 get acquainted with that uh, relatively quickly. Sure. Thank you so much for that. And um, tell us about some of the changes that it has brought about. You just mentioned the, um, the mandatory disclosure form, and I was about to actually ask you about that. So let's also just touch on that in terms of what it is and what it means um, 
for even consumers because a consumer might be watching and they're hearing the fact that this form is man mandatory and does it imp impact them does it impact um, their dealings with um, property practitioners just talk us through some of those changes that it has brought yeah and I think it's so important because uh, another th uh, point or uh, thing that we want to bring about with the promulgation of the act is to address um, inequality in terms of um, protecting the rights of consumers and also developing um, and, and making the, uh, the uh, industry uh, more equitable. So the mandatory disclosure form is, um, it's a form that should be attached to uh, any agreement. For instance, the most common one would be the offer to purchase agreement. Um, I think there's a misconception amongst practitioners that, you know, oh my Lord, this is now another form of red tape that I have to go through. I have to get this landlord to complete yet another document. But actually, it is a saving grace to a practitioner because it's there pr to protect them. Um, and um, there's also a misconception in, in the sense that a practitioner might be under the um, belief that it's them who has to complete the, the mandatory disclosure form. But that's not the case. It's actually the uh, the um, the owner who who has to complete the mandatory disclosure form and set out in what state the property is at the time that the transaction is is concluded. Obviously, one of the biggest um, things to to things that the or changes that the act has brought about is that if you do not have a mandatory disclosure form in place, um, and if there is a claim made against uh, for instance, if a, if a purchaser uh, lays a claim in respect of um, the state of a property, they can actually sue the practitioner in their personal uh, capacity. So it is something extremely important. Um, um, and it, yeah, that's pretty much it. Sure. And with all of these changes that it has introduced, especially um, this this new mandatory form, um, what are some of those changes or some of or some of the things that maybe in your opinion you would have hoped were in were in this new act? You know, some of the changes that you would have maybe wanted to see, or even additions or or even omissions that you would have liked to see in the act. Yeah, I think to me, if you asked any attorney or, or lawyer what would you have done d differently? And I, I mean, there's a multitude of things that we could point to. But there was a greater need, need in the industry to address um, the problems with inequality. And obviously, the you know, those all those other role players in the property industry, apart from estate agents, who are who are operating and are not held to any uh, regulatory standard. So what I'm saying is, I think it's best to to let Property Practitioners Act take its course in its current form, mm. because it's too early at this stage, and there is a greater need to to really give it um, a, a shot um, before we can say this must be changed. Sure. And do you believe that it has addressed those inequalities? Because, I mean, access to, to market for a lot of people who want to become property practitioners now, it's called, or estate agents, as it was called previously, was quite easy. You know, it didn't matter really what you studied. You could have easily become an estate agent. So it, it, it allowed, you know, easy access to market. And we're all aware, you know, easy access to market really ripple effects into abuse. So are we now saying that mm -hmm. those inequalities have now been resolved because of that? I would, I would hope to see that in the future. I think for a long time, the property industry has been, for lack of a better word, a boys club. And we want to see um, the introduction of, of new players, especially um, previously disadvantaged uh, persons. Um, and the biggest thing that the Act contributes in this regard is the um, requirement for all property practitioners to submit a BEE certificate. Mm. So I would like to see, um, I would like to see that change. I obviously can't say we're there yet, but um, and obviously there are there's, you know, we can say oh, but there's so there's so much more that has to be done. But I think what we're doing is we're creating the we're creating uh, the sector bigger uh, for for more people. Sure. Um, thank you so much for that. Let's talk about the Fidelity Fund Certificate. What is this and how does it impact or how does it, how is it closely related to the Act? 
Yeah, so fidelity fund certificates, not something necessarily that was new. It was a requirement in terms of the State Agency Affairs Act. Basically, it's there to um, protect a consumer who may have suffered a fiduciary uh, loss due to theft of funds by a practitioner. Hmm. Um, I think more than that, it it is that rubber stamp that practitioners require to um, to show that they are actually registered and recognised by the um, the re regulatory board, and also that they are held to the standards of the board. So, as I mentioned, they're going to um, have to obtain or to comply with the BE certificate, and um, first to that they're going to have to get a tax certificate. Mm. So the current deadlines for um, property practitioners who have are trading under an existing uh, um, FFC um, is set for, they've got a deadline until January 2023. Um, other guys who are new to the sector will have to obtain this by the end of October. Although I, I would stress that this is all, um, you know, it's all very, uh, it's capable of being changed quite quickly. So I would say keep an eye out on the on the website for, for those updates. Sure. And just to add, you know, um, a question that I'm just really thinking about it as we have this conversation is to say, with the, with the Property Practitioner Act on one hand and the Fidelity Fund Certificate on one hand, do you believe that there is enough um, regulation that, that protects both practitioners as well as consumers in terms of um, acts and regulations and all of those things that need to be adhered to? Absolutely. Absolutely. And I think the biggest um, contributor to that is the um, in, the encompassing of these other role players in the industry. These guys, um, you know, before sort of went under the radar and um, they got a cut without having an FFC in place. And I think that the, the regulatory board obviously wants to 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 address this and make sure that uh, all players and not just the state agents are held to a standard to ensure that um, consumers are, are protected and, um, and uh, that the, the regulations are enforced. Sure. No, thank you so much for that. And um, before we get, we get to the tail end of our conversation tonight, what would happen in the event that um, anybody, whether a property practitioner or even a consumer, is found contravening these acts? Are they facing jail time? Are they facing a fine? Is there something? Uh, sorry, uh, I couldn't hear you there. Could you repeat the last bit? It was, is, are there any repercussions for anybody who is found contravening the act? Yeah, so, so I think the biggest scary thing is those agents who operate with out of FFC, um, they're not entitled to to any commission that they that they would ordinarily be entitled to, um, and then also um, uh, those um, practitioners who don't have the mandatory disclosure form in place um, are sub you know um, subject to potential uh, personal liability. Um, there is the the um, the board. The regulatory board is pretty much functions as the EA did. So this does re like um, mean that they have to um, enforce enforce certain sanctions and disciplinary conduct. Last question for tonight is to say, in light of the act and some of the regulations that we spoke about, what advice would you give somebody who is a property practitioner and is out there? What advice would you give to them for them to to ensure that they comply with the new acts? Yeah. So I would say. The biggest thing, and I probably can't stress this enough, is training. Mm. So it's imperative, and it's not just to get your PDE points. Um, there's so much training uh, resources available, and it's actually freely available. Even uh, the material that can be found on, on our website. And if I may also just point uh, some of the viewers to, um, to the uh, Property Law Alliance. It's a Facebook group, and it's actually um, a, a partnership between SSLR Incorporated, Bruno Smell Attorneys, and um, uh, so so basically, there we 
every Wednesday, uh, Silna Stein, Managing Director, and Bruno, they sit down and they, they actually uh, answer everyone's questions. Mm -hmm. So I think there's a, there's a massive, there needs to be a massive emphasis on um, equipping yourself with, with all the information um, that is available. And thank you so much for coming to the show and equipping a lot of people who are watching tonight with this great information in terms of the Property Practitioners Act. Thank you so much for joining us, Claire, and have a good evening. It's my pleasure. Thank, thank you. you too. And if you are out there and you're a property practitioner, make sure that you get training in, in terms of the act and know exactly what needs to be done in, in order for you to be uh, on the right side of the law. Thank you so much for joining us for tonight's episode. And remember, a good dose of property information might just be what you need to get yourself back on that property A game. Until next time, we see you right here on the Private Property Podcast every weekday, 7 p.m. My name is Dumi. Have a good evening. <laughs>